Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jay Chapa. I'm Deputy City Manager for the City of Fort Worth. And tonight we will be providing more information about the meet and confer agreement between the City of Fort Worth and the Fort Worth Police Officers Association. After a brief overview of the agreement and the process that we go through to draft it, we will answer some of the questions that were sent in prior to tonight's meeting. And you can also call in with questions this evening and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the allotted time. If we don't get to all of the questions during the show, we will post all of the answers on social media and on the city's website. Before I get into the overview of the pro proposed agreement, I wanted to provide a little background. The meet and confer agreement is uh, basically an agreement between management and the police officer association that is the union for the police officers. Uh, it is similar to what uh, American Airlines does with their pilots, and it's similar to um, what GM does with their auto workers. The process for putting this agreement together was about a year long, the series of meetings um, where we used the existing agreement and then we worked off of that with requests from the Police Officers Association as well as requests from the city management for changes to the agreement. As I mentioned, it is a negotiation. Several of the requests made by the Police Officers Association as well as several of the requests or changes sought by management of the city will not be found in this negotiated agreement because we could not come to an agreement or one side or the other did not want to um, move in that direction. So with that, I just wanted to provide that background. Uh, we're gonna go into a PowerPoint presentation so we can cover uh, the details and um, some of the background on the actual agreement before you. So the background on the agreement. The uh, meet and confer is, is, a, um, is an agreement that because the police department operates under chapter 143 of the Texas Local Government Code, which is basically known as civil service. Uh, this agreement that we have here um, is, is provided the city of Fort Worth can enter into a meet and confer agreement, um, which is the equivalent, as I mentioned, to a labor agreement. And it must be entered into with a sole and exclusive bargaining agent that represents the police officers. In this case, the, um, the Fort Worth Police Officer Association is the uh, bargaining agent. In November, 2000, November 7, 2006, there was a meet and confer election and the voters of Fort Worth approved and authorized the city to recognize uh, the employee association as the sole and ex exclusive bargaining agent for the police officers and to make agreements with the Employees Association as provided by state law. A petition was signed by the majority of the police officers, which basically made the Fort Worth Police Officer Association their sole exclusive bargaining agent. After the meet and confer agreement um, goes through the negotiation between the city and the POA concerning pay, benefits, working conditions, and following the following steps must, must occur. The entire agreement needs to be ratified by the majority of the membership of the Police Officers Association. And then the entire agreement must be approved by the City Council. Currently we are at the stage where the agreement has been ratified by the Police Officers Association and the City Council will be taking up a decision to whether or not to approve or deny the, the uh, agreement on August 4th. If either party um, does not approve the agreement, the parties can st restart the negotiations and try to reach a new agreement, or they can allow the agreement to expire. The first meet and confer agreement was approved um, in 2007, and it, or 2008, and it covered the time frame from 2008 to 2013. After that, a second agreement was approved in 2013 and covered that time period to 2017. And then finally, the one that is set to expire uh, to end on September 30th of 2020 started in 2017. There is one, a one year uh, evergreen period that in case you can't get the negotiations completed by September 30th of this year that allows the negotiations to continue. If no new agreement is done by that 
the end of that one year of agreeing, then the agreement actually expires altogether. And the city would end up, and the, uh, the um, city and the police department would be follow under the uh, chapter 143 of the state code. So people often ask, why do we have a meet and confer agreement? The chapter 143 of the state code has many requirements that are outdated or unworkable in a modern city, especially the size of Fort Worth. Many of the items in that code relate to smaller cities uh, and to a simpler time. The only way to change the requirements in the chapter 123 or 143 is to have a labor agreement. The agreement allows the city and the POA to control how to run the operations, in this case, you don't have to rely on the legislature. The labor agreement controls uh, and preempts any conflicting state statute, ordinance, or civil service uh, commission rule. So in essence, it allows us to set the rules locally and on how to interact with our, our labor, uh, in this case, the Police Officer Association. Um, the negotiation time frame, go back, sorry. The negotiation time frame, July 30th to 2019 uh, through April 30th of 2020 is the time frame that we had, uh, that we used to negotiate this agreement. Uh, we had a total of, there's 29 articles in the agreement, um, and we have 19 articles where we had basically no changes or no substantive changes made to them. The proposed term of the new agreement is we run October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2024. As I mentioned, it contains a one year evergreen period uh, and it would, um, until September 30th, 2025, this agreement would have the same clause. Uh, the, and as I mentioned, the POA membership did ratify this agreement in May of 2020. Listed before you are a number of articles, I mentioned 19, that have negligible or no changes uh, made to them. I'm gonna briefly just mention a few of the items that these articles cover, uh, just for reference. Uh, the authority and, and uh, recognition of Article 1, it basically just lays out that the POA represents all officers, not just members, paying members, but all officers, of the, of the police department. It does not include any of the appointed uh, uh, ranks, including the assistant chiefs, deputy chiefs, the commanders, or the chief himself. Um, Article two is basically definitions. It outlines spe specific definitions for terms used throughout the agreement. An example of that um, is officers. The term officers, for instance, is not, not referred to POA members specifically. Uh, and also another, as you'll see through the agreement, if you looked at it, there's a reference to business day versus calendar day. Uh, business day is the actual work day versus a calendar day because it could be days that aren't being worked. So uh, those are the type of definitions that are in there. Article three, association rights. Uh, that basically uh, pertains to uh, the, the rights the, associations have, the association has as an association with the city, uh, for instance, having payroll deductions allowed so that members can pay their dues to the association. Um, they can have, the, the association can have access to the premise, city premises to conduct business. They, um, they can ask the police chief to uh, send a uniform email, for instance, to all, of the, um, to all of the members of the association or all officers as the representing association. The police chief has to approve that. So those types of rights are laid out under that uh, article. No changes were made to that article. Uh, time off for association business. Um, that is basically, that, well, that's actually one of the, where we had changes, so I'll cover that on the next, um, as, as we go along. Management rights. The, this agreement does not, uh, grant the city management rights. The rights are, are already held by city management uh, and the MCA does, does not have anything to say about it. The city retains its rights to hire, fire, uh, train, assign and transfer, promotion and demotion, discipline, suspend, 
uh, issues about job evalu performance and evaluations um, about how you know uniform should be, what equipment to use, the safety operations, all those things are outlined there, but it does not confer any of those rights to the city. The city and, and its management, including the chief, um, have those rights already. Uh, Article six, the no strike, no lockout, that's basically what it means, that the uh, police officers cannot strike or lock out and, or be locked out, um, and they can't support or sanction any, um, anything related to strikes or not coming into work. Uh, Article 8, <coughs> dispute resolution procedures. Um, this area has, has things to do with uh, only matters regarding interpretation, application, enforcement, or alleged violation of specific provisions of the actual agreement uh, shall be subject to grievance procedure. Uh, so they can't, for instance, uh, dispute disciplinary matters of individual officers. Um, it sets out the time frames and the steps for bringing forward a complaint on uh, the, the city side for or grieving a, a matter related to the contract. Article nine, labor um, consultation process. The, uh, it basically outlines that the Fort Worth Police Officers Association is the sole and exclusive bargaining agent for the covered um, officers. Uh, the chief or others cannot, management cannot bargain with any other representatives that outside of that entity. Um, and, and it also la lays out that the chief needs to meet with the POA's uh, president and officers once a month. Article 12, compensatory, compensatory time and special event staffing. Um, This is an article that's in there that's, that allows the city to pay comp time instead of overtime uh, if, the, if an officer agrees. It also sets maximums for the amount of compensatory time allowed. Uh, it also allows the city to staff big events uh, and special events and it outlines how that, that will be handled. Um, article 18 or 16, vacant uh, promotional positions resulting from military leave of absence. Um, it's Article 16. Uh, this, this basically covers that area of um, how to deal with when you have vacant, pro uh, vacant promotional positions that result from somebody going on a military leave of absence or while they're off on military leave. Uh, it just covers those areas. Article 19, holidays is exactly that, just covers the specifics on how to deal with holidays and, and what the officers receive. Article 20, sh shift differentials. Um, officers get paid different wages depending on the shift, especially they work overnight shift. It lays out uh, what those times are and how they get paid and what the differentials are. Article 21, civilianization of certain sworn officer positions. Um, this article provides um, that the city cannot replace sworn officers with civilians. And so in essence, we can't not reduce the, um, the number of sworn positions and replace them with civilians. Um, it, the only time you can do that under case law is if it requires special knowledge to, to do that police work. But in the case of the, uh, this would have to be something negotiated. Article 22, tuition reimbursement is exactly that, provides for officers to have tuition reimbursement as a, uh, um, a service in the city for, for going forward to get a degree. That's actually something that's provided to all city employees. Article 23, um, a reopener provision for healthcare and pension benefits. Basically it allows, if the city uh, wants to make changes to our healthcare, and or a pension system to either strengthen either one or provide some kind of savings. It provides, uh, allows the, uh, the uh, city to approach the POA with opening the, the, um, the contract before when it's gonna be time to, to renew it uh, so that we can talk about those specific um, issues. Article 24, off-duty employment, the city owned, uh, um, at city-owned facilities. Uh, that specifically um, has to do with 
security service provided, for instance, at the convention center at Will Rogers, uh, those kind of times when police officers are not working as police officers, they're off duty, but they're wor working as security in their police officer uniforms, how that's handled, how they get paid, and so that they're being basically directed by whoever's managing that event at that time and, and not necessarily the city. So that lays those things out. Uh, Article 25, the complete agreement, um, it clarifies that the city can, um, it, it, it basically entered the, the memorandum of understanding that to clarify or interprets any provision of the MCA um, and that the only agreement that exists is between, is this agreement between the city and the POA. Um, and that if it's not, if something is not in the agreement, then it doesn't exist and, and we can't really negotiate that outside of that and you can't, you can't have a grievance for something that's not in the agreement. Um, Article 26, the savings clause. Um, it basically says that if there is some reason a court or some entity finds uh, any part of, the in, of this agreement to, to be invalid under law, it doesn't do away with the whole agreement. The remaining pieces of the agreement not related to what that one issue might be if, if law changes that's no, no longer valid, the rest of the agreement would still be in place. And then finally, notice is basically Article 29 is just to, um, um, whom gets, who at the city and who in the POA would get notices with any time there's a, um, a grievance or some kind of communication that needs to occur. So those are all the articles that were basically stayed the same. Now we're gonna go more in depth into the articles that um, had more significant changes um, and those are laid out here. Um, Article 4, uh, time for, time for um, assistance association business. Um, disciplinary action, Article 10, wages and certain pays. Hiring for beginning positions, the physical fitness program, promotions, demotions and restatements, reinstatements, non-discrimination, maintenance of standards, duration, termination, and special leave provisions. And I'll go through each of those quickly. Article four, time for association business. Basically, um, the, our, our, the agreement provides that the city will allocate 6,000 hours to be used for association business by the president. Those hours are used by the president and um, any of the officers while they're doing association business. The majority of those hours, as we call them ABL, is funded by deducting three hours from each police officer's vacation bank. So the, because we have about 1,700 uh, 1700 officers, uh, that translates to having about 5,400 of those 6,000 hours covered by that vacation time. So it doesn't actually call, cost the city any additional dollars because that vacation, those vacation hours are already provided. So an additional 600 hours is added to that. And this allows then the board members and the president to work on, uh, on the police association business uh, while using those hours. Um, the, the ABL is only available to POA board members uh, and the negotiating team. So during this whole period of several meetings we had over the last year or so, the, the members that represented the POA, they used those hours uh, while they were uh, conducting their business. Um, and the, they can also use those hours to conduct uh, association business activities. For instance, if they're uh, doing something in the community or having meetings with uh, other, other officials and the like, they can use those hours for that time. Some of the changes that were made in, in the agreement, the proposed changes, uh, was one, was in order not to reduce the strength of the authorized strength of the department. So currently, the way the current agreement and the past agreements have been is that the police, the police officer association president uh, is a full-time uh, employee with the POA when he's elected or she's elected. And so at that, at that point, they no longer have their position with the police department. So the police department was basically working with one less position 
during that time period. What we were suggested here and what was negotiated is that the POA president would be the POA president during their tenure and we would backfill that position. So we added a position so that the police department and the chief would then have that position available as a full-time position to city. If the, in the future, if the, the president changes and basically the current president goes back to their old position and whoever gets, um, gets elected, then their position becomes available for someone to fill. And this way, we're not reducing the overall number of police officers out, uh, on the street. Um, we also included a, an additional category where the ABL could be used by the POA members, the board members, and that basically is tied to critical uh, police incidents. Uh, oftentimes, the, the Police Office Association uh, will provide support for issues when, uh, for instance, recently we had a police officer that was struck by a, a vehicle. The Police Office Association provided a lot of support to that. They could respond to that critical incident and they could use ABL hours and be uh, representatives of the Police Office Association versus being uh, representatives as, as police officers themselves because they weren't working. Um, and then it also, uh, in this agreement, allows the president to petition the chief to extend additional ABL time uh, for designated uh, association board members. Uh, for instance, if, if there is um, a reason that uh, a member needs to uh, use ABL to, to represent the police officer association for a week, for instance, he could petition the chief to ask for that to happen so that that person can attend whatever function might be that that would be the case. And the chief would have to approve that in order for that to occur. Article 5, management rights. No changes were made here. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the city does, the, our agreement does not uh, provide the city management any rights. Those rights are, exist already with or without the agreement. Uh, and so there's no reason to say that, but we just wanted to lay out uh, that the police chief and the city retain those rights even though we have this agreement uh, in place. Article 7, disciplinary action. Um, basically, this generally applies to administrative investigations, uh, which is defined of when the internal affairs section of the, of the department actually uh, do an investigation that could result in suspension, demotion, or some type of uh, additional in, in indefinite suspension of, um, of, a, of an officer because they've done something. It does not, in this case, or the, when we're talking about disciplinary actually, the internal affairs does not investigate allegations of criminal conduct by police officers. The police department has a special investigation unit a uh, special investigation unit that, that actually performs those types of, of uh, investigations. So when we're talking about this Article 7 and disciplinary action, it does not pertain to any issues where a potential criminal investigation or, or something has been done criminally by an officer. Um, when uh, uh, supervisors do an investigation, the chain of command, which is basically the supervisory chain, they can transfer it to the internal affairs for further action uh, along with information that the supervisor has gathered. Uh, this is not to be used, when, when this happens, it's not to be used to get around officer rights in Article 7. So when that happens, you gotta follow, you gotta follow Article 7, and we just made, cleared that language associated with that. Um, it also, the changes were made that it includes prohibitions on who can investigate uh, in this situation. Uh, one of the other changes that was made is that an officer that is subject to an inve administrative ex investigation has the right to be informed upon inquiry of the identities of each investigator participating in the interrogation of the officer. So basically, the officer can ask, find out who's going to be investigating them and who's doing the investigation. Um, they can also request a copy of their own written or verbal statement. Um, the The Officer cannot release the copy to any other person uh, other than him, to himself or to his association or peer representative or legal counsel. So the officer does have the right to have 
a representative of the POA uh, be with him and or legal counsel. Um, and then all evidence that's part of this investigation remains with the internal affairs section, but the officers has the allow, uh, is allowed uh, a t the opportunity to review, we can't copy, can't take anything with them, any of the information collected, and then the, uh, the investigator determines when the officer is allowed to review this. So the in this case, we made a change that allows the officer to uh, see the, the information um, before they're interviewed. Article 7 addresses um, the condition of 48 hours prior to the notice of, of the general nature of the investigation uh, before an officer can be interviewed by internal affairs. Uh, this is basically a due process part of the investigation. It does not, as, as I mentioned before, this has nothing to do with uh, any kind of criminal investigation. If the, in, in this case, uh, officer is compare, compelled when they're doing an administrative review of something by the chief to, inter to um, provide a statement and be interviewed, they get notice and they have 48, it can't happen within, uh, prior to 48 hours of notice. If an inc incident involves some kind of criminal activity or some kind of suspicion and SIU is doing the investigation, uh, the 48 hour um, uh, rule does not apply. Uh, in, this ca in that case, the officer has all the do same civil rights and due rights of, of anybody and they don't, aren't, can't be compelled to testify against themselves or to give a statement against themselves. So it does not apply, apply in that case. Um, this article also outlines where interviews can take place. Uh, that the change is also made that a recording device can be used in interviews so that uh, everything can be recorded and, and there's no um, mistakes made when reports are written. Uh, it provides for confidentiality and um, by law, a police officer, again, can't be compelled to, to give a statement and in in, cannot be compelled to be, give a statement in a criminal case, but they can in an administrative investigation. Uh, so it does provide guarantee protection uh, where that, that statement cannot be used in, in, a, in a criminal case against them. Article 7 changes made also include how uh, the administrative interview process procedures work. Um, the officer now has a, will have the right to an association or peer representative, as I mentioned before, to be present during the uh, administrative review. And so it, basically the article sets out all of the uh, procedures related to that. Uh, it also added that suspension, disciplinary suspensions can be delivered to the affected officer or his or her attorney. So it can be go through the attorney if you can't find the officer themselves. Um, it also provides guidance regarding interplay of criminal and administrative cases where officers are indicted or charged with felonies or class A or B misdemeanors. And basically, it, it, there are certain steps that have to be taken if a officer has been indicted um, and the uh, officers that, that are indicted of a, a felony can be, is officially charged with the commission of a class A or B misdemeanor or a felony or are convicted or quit, acquitted or otherwise um, absolved as such, to, they notify the chief within 48 hours. And then that begins the process on, on um, for the disciplinary action that, any disciplinary action that might be taken by the chief. Um, they can be suspended until 45 days following the final disposition of the criminal case. Um, and they can, the officer can delay or request a delay of any related civil service commission hearings until 30 days following the final disposition of the case. Uh, oftentimes in these situations, there, there is some kind of disciplinary action and then oftentimes there's an appeal. And so you go through a process of having a civil service commission or uh, some kind of a review of that discipline before it all comes to to a final um, to a final uh, ending one way or the other. Uh, it also lays that a conviction of a felony will automatically terminate employment. A conviction of a class A or class B may lead to disciplinary action up to termination, but that 
uh, becomes uh, the choice of the chief or their decision. So some of the changes that on that it just that were made were to further clarify the officer's rights during the investigation. Uh, it suspends the internal investigations during an officer's military deployment. Oftentimes we have uh, several officers that may be called up to military and they're, uh, they are gone for a period of time, six months or a year. Uh, while they're gone, an issue comes up where um, command staffers, their supervisors, were reviewing uh, some type of, of, of incident or, or some type of dis potential disciplinary action. Under state law, that has to occur within 180 days. Um, but they're gone for more than 180 days. You basically don't have the opportunity to actually do the, um, the investigation and provide the discipline. Well, we negotiate into the agreement the ability to have that time basically frozen so that those 180 days do not run while they're off on military leave. Um, the changes also provide for procedures during disciplinary settlement negotiations between the officer the chief and the command staff. It, is, it allows the chief to now negotiate uh, beyond what's allowed under 143 uh, with, the, uh, with the officer and not just require them uh, under 143. There are certain provisions that say they can suspend for 15 days or they have to then indefinitely suspend or go to a much harsher uh, penalty that oftentimes gets appealed and then gets reversed. In this case, the chief can negotiate something that's more than the, the minimum amount, but allows the, the, takes away the officer's right to appeal, and they end up negotiating a, a discipline that, that makes sense. Article 10, wages and certain pays, it basically lays out how wages are gonna work on an annual basis. Um, Appendix C shows the, the pay schedule for each of the uh, police ranks, and um, it also includes what the across the board and the step, what we call step raises would be. The changes that were made, um, to give a little bit of background on this, as we entered negotiations, the city management's uh, stance was that we would uh, be willing to negotiate on the wages and o overall cost of the contract, um, so how much it would cost the city and the city taxpayers, uh, with a cap at 3% annually, if you put a cap 3% annually, then a, what that total number was over a four, four year period. And so the negotiation was basically, um, we, we opened the, the uh, ability to have conversations with the Police Officer Association. Um, as long, anything having to do with wages or special pays or anything, as long as we didn't go over that four year dollar amount, that equaled a 3% increase on an annual basis. Um, and so you'll see in, in the next slide what the actual increases are for, uh, on an annual basis for across the board wa wages, wage increases. But because as we were finishing this negotiation, the COVID situation came forward and uh, the, the state shut down, the city shut down, um, a big portion of the overall budget for the police department includes the CCPD, the Crime Control Prevention District sales tax that was recently approved. Um, because this, that sales tax has been impacted by the COVID situation and the city's budget overall is being impacted by the COVID but, uh, situation, we had to go back and, and add some additional discussions with the Police Officers Association related to the already closed out and, uh, and um, uh, negotiations on wages. And so basically what we, the negotiations laid out was a three-tier scenario um, that would be based on what the next year's wages would be tied to how well the CCPD sales tax performs during the end of this uh, fiscal year. Um, it also, in, in the in this uh, section, we clarified um, a piece about acting pay. So when, a, when an officer is moved up to a higher ranking uh, because that is vacant for a period of time, but they don't have the position permanently, they would receive acting pay. It just clarifies that the uh, officer will receive either the lowest 
pay of the higher rank or a 5% increase if the person's already making at least the lowest rank, whichever is uh, greater. So getting into the wages, uh, what was negotiated originally um, was a request and, and city approved, as I mentioned, we weren't going to go over the 3% if you average that out on an annual basis. So what was negotiated would be a 4% increase next year, but then that would drop in the subsequent three years to 2.87, 2%, and then 2% in, in year four uh, to keep those those numbers down uh, below as the the original number we're trying to reach. Um, that was the original agreement. What we ended up doing is uh, based on the CCPD sales tax collections, if those decrease, uh, the decreases that we see this year are between zero and 5% or, or better, um, then we would keep that negotiated, those negotiated numbers. If the sales tax collections come in worse from five, five to 10% less than what they were the year before, then next year's actual increase drops to 2%. And we adjust the following years to get back to that 3% average across as you go forward. And if the sales tax on the CCPD is actually much worse and it's over 10% less, the uh, police officers would not receive a zero, they would not receive a, a uh, increase next year in, in their across the board uh, uh, wages, but then we would adjust the following three years to make up that difference. So that's what the changes were for the um, wage proposal as we went forward. Article 11 uh, basically it lays out um, some of the conditions that are required for hiring new positions in the, in the Fort Worth Police Department when we're recruiting and it increased points. Uh, one of the efforts that the police department has and the POA uh, uh, agreed is with is to uh, increase the overall education, uh, the uh, level of education of the people that come in and get recruited. So we increase points for candidates with a bachelor's degree uh, so they would get an extra point if you had or already have a bachelor's degree when you apply to the uh, uh, to the, the police department. Uh, previously, there were some points added if a person, um, I'm sorry, uh, we'd also, we reinstated this past year the Fort Worth Cadets Program, which basically is a program targeted at um, uh, uh, individuals between the age of 16 and 21. And... Um, uh, you cannot become a police officer until you're 21, so they, it targets them, the uh, cadet program, to come and work with the police department, learn about the police department, um, get some experience. They're not officers, uh, but they go through basically a training program, and then if they apply to become police officers, they would, uh, if they graduate from that program, they would get additional points uh, in the over on the front end. And then there was extra points for Fort Worth residency that was removed, uh, in essence, uh, one of the reasons be, was because uh, it, we saw that it was having a negative impact in our attempt to recruit on the diversity side. Uh, we wanted to be, have a bigger pool, and uh, uh, oftentimes uh, that, would, that was having a negative uh, impact there. Um, and then on Article 14, we've made changes to the physical fitness program. Um, it provides that as as the uh, police chief and the uh, command staff want to make changes in the training staff to the physical ass assessment test, uh, that the police officer association would have a representative included on that committee uh, uh, when they make changes to that. And it also requires that uh, any officers on, on Family Medical Leave Act, uh, the American Disability Act, or line of duty, or any other type of sickness uh, leave uh, that they need to obtain a medical release prior to conducting the physical exam. One of the reasons that occurs is because the physical exam, if a police officer passes the physical exam, they're eligible for a, a special pay stipend. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that <laughs> there wasn't a situation where somebody might be out of work or have some kind of injury but want to do it just to receive the stipend. We would need a doctor's uh, okay for them to come off of the out of that situation before they could actually take the exam. Article 15, uh, the promotions, demotions, and reinstatements. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the appointed positions are not subject to, uh, are not part of the Police Officer Association, 
and not subject to this agreement. Um, basically, the assistant chief, the police chief appoints assistant chiefs, deputy chiefs, and the commander positions. Um, they are exempt from competitive examinations like the rest of the department. Uh, the chief is not required to make these appointments with any particular time period. Um, and the chief has a right to demote someone and they have no appeal rights. Of course, they cannot be, dem under the state law, they can't be demoted beyond what their previous rank was before they became a, uh, an, appointed, uh, in a an appointed position. So for instance, if a deputy chief is demoted and they were a captain before they became a commander and then deputy chief, they would, they needed, they would need to go back to being a captain and that's far, the demotion could only go that far back. Um, it also clarifies that a commander, uh, the chief can uh, appoint one commander per patrol division that was put in there just to specify as the city of Fort Worth continues to grow. We currently have six patrol divisions. If we add a seventh, you'd have the ability to add a commander position to do that as we go forward. Um, under the promotions, demotions, and reinstatements, um, also uh, the, the, the article provides for minimum requirements for taking promotional exams, uh, how long you have to be in a certain position, prior to taking a test, it was mentioned, uh, all the positions but the appointed positions, the increase from one rank to the other does require a test and then based on your scoring on the test is, is whether or not you have the opportunity to move into the next rank when a position becomes available. Um, uh, it clarifies that promotional processes, once it's started, when the test is given, it continues even if the agreement expires. It also provides for how long an eligibility last. A list for a, a certain test um, will last prior to it going dormant and then you have to redo it. Uh, so if no vacancies come open, then those folks would have to take the test again, for instance. Uh, and it just clarifies certain um, um, pieces of, of how officers are promoted. The proposed changes overall, um, Basically, it provides for new educational requirements after an appointment to assistant chief, deputy chief, or commander is, is done. Uh, currently, captains are required to have a certain level of, of uh, education. And the idea was that to ensure that anybody that was in an appointed position above a captain ultimately would have it, at a minimum the same level of education is required for a captain position. Uh, it also establish a, a review board, we're establishing a review board of officer, for officer promotional appeals. So when somebody appeals a, the fact that they didn't score as high because they believe something was wrong with the test, um, the, there's a, a new appeal process that would involve existing officers rather than the Civil Service Commission, where a blind group of, of, of the professional officers in that area that really are the subject matter experts would get to provide a decision on whether or not a question is fair or how the test would be administered was fair. Uh, oftentimes the Civil Service Commission process takes a much longer time. Article 17 um, is a non-discrimination clause in the uh, uh, agreement uh, and basically says the city, neither the city nor the POA will discriminate in employment of police officers based on any protected class, that's race, color, national origin, religion, age, sex, gender, sexual orientation, military, veteran status, or disability or handicap. Um, and the POA has the duty of fair representation for all officers, not just those that are members. So they have, uh, it lays that out in this, in this agreement. And then it also um, states that the city will not interfere with any of the POA operations or the dealings with their members as they, as they go forward. The changes that were Proposed for this uh, agreement is basically um, we included language that protected rights of officers to include the reporting of suspected violations of the meet and confer agreement. So in, eff in essence, uh, it's the if they believe that the city uh, or if someone is making, is doing something that is in violation of the meet and for, uh, confer agreement, they can bring that forward and it protects them. And we also clarified that um, because an officer makes that type of uh, suspects a violation of the of the provision, it, this will not interfere with any kind of discipline that's going on with their work duties. So uh, the situation 
because they're an officer is maybe being disciplined for some reason and they bring up, uh, they believe that a meet and confer violation has occurred in that process, the discipline piece will still go forward so it can't interfere with that. Article 18, the maintenance of standards. Um, uh, this basically provides that certain specific items, except for sp certain specific items, special pays and leave allowances that existed in writing as of the effective date of this approved agreement shall remain in, uh, unchanged. So basically, um, it just lays out that these things will continue as you go forward. The changes that are being recommended in that area is that um, the city will provide the POA 180 day advance notice prior to making any additional changes to our pension uh, system. As most uh, people know that the pension system was changed recently in the, in the last year. Basically it, it included increases of both the membership employees of the city's contribution to the pension and the city's contribution to the pension. Those are set uh, currently if additional changes need to be made. This basically just calls out that the city needs to give the POA 180 days advance notice uh, before that was going to occur. That a similar uh, notice is, is required in the firefighters uh, um, agreement as well, the firefighter association. And also um, in any situation where the police department or the, the police department of the city overpays wrongfully or, or um, um, overpays a, an employee, a, a police officer, uh, because of the way the wages were calculated or the number of hours per week and it was incorrect, uh, that the city will work with the police office association to, um, with, the, with the actual officer that's impacted to collect those dollars back uh, instead of just going directly to the police officer that will include the police association in those discussions. And then Article 27 basically lays out when the agreement ends, uh, which is uh, September 30th, 24th, it begins um, and then has the one year um, evergreen period after that if a negotiation is not successful during that time. Article 28 is a new provision um, that was brought forward uh, by the Police Officer Association and as I mentioned earlier, the city management laid out a overall cost of contract not to exceed 3% per year and any of the different types of pays that are available that would be covered under that. Uh, so the Police Office Association's request was to increase the number of hours that a police, uh, a person that retires from the city or leaves the city could receive upon retirement. So officers currently under state law are able to receive 720 hours of accrued sick leave so that basically they're able to accrue sick leave and if they leave and they have up to 120 hours, the city is required to pay that upon separation. So they get paid for the sick leave only up to 720 hours. Uh, they requested to increase that amount. Um, we, after uh, back and forth negotiations and the impacts that would have on the overall wages, uh, we came to a negotiated number of 1,000. So starting next year with this new agreement, when an officer separates from the city of Fort Worth, if they have up to a thousand hours, they would be able to receive that in compensation as they leave the city. Uh, that did have an impact to uh, what the officers would receive in across the board pay, uh, and the, that was included in those numbers um, spelled out in what was shown earlier on the payments. And so that basically wraps up the overall agreement. Um, as we went into this whole process for uh, the meet and confer agreement, we wanted to, to uh, we had a few goals in mind and uh, we believe that we've, we've basically achieved those goals through this agreement. As I mentioned, we're going to go through a Q&A here in a minute to, to answer questions that came in. But the goals of the overall agreement were to maintain the appropriate management rights for the chief under state law. Uh, the chief of police of any police department is the one that has the discipline, hiring, and firing uh, power and we want to make sure those are, were kept and are improved in some cases. Uh, it increases the department's professionalism by implementing educational requirements uh, for appointed positions and uh, adds, adds the ability for folks with bachelor's um, degrees to come in, have additional points. 
Uh, that's something that the POA has been pushing significantly. They'd like to make sure that the, as we go along, that the overall department becomes more professional and has, um, is stronger as they go forward. It provides flexible and fair compensation in light of economic impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic on the city's revenues. As I mentioned, uh, the actual compensation piece was already negotiated uh, before uh, the pandemic hit and we were able to in include some provisions to be able to, to uh, sidestep that issue uh, if, if we need to. Um, it constrains the wage increases to reflect the current fiscal challenges. Uh, it does provide officers appropriate protections during the disciplinary process and it also guarantees what the wages will look like. It helps us in our recruitment of officers by doing that. Uh, people know what they're coming into and what the situation is uh, in a very difficult environment for police officers. And um, it continues to provide the city council control over, <clears throat> over pension benefits as we go forward. So will that, we will move into the question and answer. So after this overview, some of the questions um, that we received from residents, some of these questions did not deal directly with the contract, but other police issues. We're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as possible during our program. Uh, tonight, the first person I'm joined uh, here with is uh, Chief Ed Kraus. He is going to help answer some of these questions. Thank you, Chief, for, for coming. Uh, the first question that we have has to do with scheduling of officers. Jerry Waller, the question is Jerry Waller and Tatiana Jefferson were killed by rookie police officers. Where is the provision outlining that seniority will not impact scheduling to ensure rookies are no longer paired together? And when I say the question asks rookies, um, uh, some of these officers were there for two or three years, so its definition of rookies could be called into question, but I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so all rookies are paired with a more senior officer during the field training phase, which occurs immediately upon a graduation from the police academy. During the field training phase, the rookie rides with, learns from, and is evaluated by a senior officer. That officer is recommended through their chain of command up to the commander um, based on their performance uh, history, and then they go through a training course be to become a field training officer. Once they, the officer successfully completes the field training phase, that officer is released to solo patrol status. Uh, Fort PD operates on a sol solo patrol philosophy. Uh, we typically do not pair up officers of any seniority in a car, uh, although there are some exceptions. Uh, solo patrols provide more coverage for our geographically large city. Pairing two officers in one vehicle reduces in half the number of cars that are available to respond to calls and the number of beats that can be covered. Uh, response times would suffer. So an example would be if you have a division that has nine beats on a shift and you have eight officers show up to work, if you double those officers up, you're only going to be able to cover four beats. Um, whereas if each officer is out in their own car, they can cover eight beats. Um, Additionally, calls that could be handled by one officer, such as uh, tagging property, uh, a stranded motorist, guard duty at a hospital, would then take two officers out of service. So we typically do not pair up officers. Uh, the staffing situation in Fort Worth PD right now is that we're in a time of high attrition. Uh, a lot of officers are retiring. We uh, currently have over 50 vacancies in the officer rank and we've been holding several academy classes over the past year and a half just to catch up. Uh, one of those classes just graduated in April and three other are currently in session. But by the time that last class graduates, we're gonna have about 140 officers with less than two years experience out in patrol. Um, and so ensuring that multiple officers with less experience won't be the first to respond to any particular call can't really be guaranteed based purely on the makeup of the workforce. However, to address that, uh, many months ago, we went ahead and uh, started rotating more senior officers that work in specialized units into the Patrol Bureau, so that interaction between veteran and rookie officers could occur. Um, to be honest, the, the COVID pandemic has, has hurt that effort because some of the specialized services officers have been tasked with COVID-related duties, and um, there's also concerns about cross-contamination between different work groups. Thank you for that answer. Now, Chief, while higher education is not necessarily a bad requirement, how will officers be educated to be streetwise about the people and neighbors that, they'll, that they all vow to protect and serve? Okay, so um, this, this 
question was asked by a community member uh, a little over a year ago at a, at a forum we were at in the East Division, and I remember specifically the example he gave. He said, how do you expect an, uh, an individual who grew up in a town like Peaster, where there's nobody that looks like me, and he spent his whole life there, how do you expect him to come out and police my community? And it, very valid point. So what we started doing with the class that graduated in April, uh, it was the first class we had since that conversation, was we started bringing community members into the police academy to speak with the recruits about their experiences, especially negative experiences they've had with Fort Worth police officers. That way our recruits can see how their actions or inactions can have a negative impact on the community they're sworn to serve. Um, and we went a step further, we said, you know what, we want to use those individuals also as role players in our scenario-based training so our officers get an authentic reaction to their actions there in the training environment and um, if they're going to fail, we want them to fail there and not fail out on the street where somebody could be harmed um, either emotionally or physically. So those are two initiatives we started. They're going to continue through these next academy classes. We actually hope to bolster the number of people that are participating in that. Um, the the uh, rookie officers, when they get out of the training, they also do that field training phase we talked about for several months, including the first week of field training, which is spent with a neighborhood police officer, and the last week of field training is spent with a neighborhood police officer to emphasize the, the role that those individuals have. And if you're not familiar with the neighborhood police officer program, uh, the NPOs, as they're called, are beat coordinators. They serve uh, on that beat, but they're not subject to calls for service, although they answer many. Um, but their job is to create a safe environment, uh, crime prevention, not necessarily crime reaction, um, and to help with some of the broken windows theories uh, where they clean up the beat and make a neighborhood look nicer and crime reduces that way. But they also deal with neighborhood disputes and problems in businesses and, and those. So getting that, those officers out in the areas where they're going to work and actually get to interact with people uh, on the beat is uh, how we address that. Well, it sounds like there's a good opportunity for community members to participate in the training of police officers if they'd like. And, Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you'd be open to having those folks contact the police department and see how they could do that. I Absolutely. think it's a good opportunity. Uh, is it really necessary, next question, is it really necessary to allow certain lateral entry officers to end training early? Would it not be best to allow every officer adequate time to get familiar with Fort Worth in our community? I think there's an assumption here that that occurs. So. Um, okay, so there, there might be exceptions where that occurs. Um, for instance, a lateral entry officer is an officer we've hired from another department. Many of those officers that we hire from other departments apply to us because they live here in Fort Worth. So they have that familiarity already, but they didn't originally work for us because of different reasons. Maybe we weren't hiring at the time. Maybe uh, they applied to several departments and another one called them first. But no officer, including lateral entry officers, are allowed to end their training phase until both that officer and their field training officer feel that officer is adequately prepared to serve our community. All right. Thank you. Now, when it comes time to reinstatement following a demotion, are there not extenuating circumstances where reinstatement is inappropriate, such as a bodily injury or harm to an other individuals or community members? Should such provisions be included in this agreement? Okay, so that Article 13 deals with a very specific situation, and you alluded to it um, as you went through the articles uh, in the presentation, but that that situation is when, say, I as a police chief decide to remove one of my assistant chiefs or deputy chiefs or commander, one of the appointed ranks, and return them to their last civil service rank. So most of that, most of the time that's going to be a captain. So if I were to take an assistant chief and remove them from the appointed ranks, they would go back to their last civil service tested rank, a captain. We only have 17 captain positions on the department which means if I'm gonna put that one back in there, the last one who promoted into that captain rank has to be demoted. So that individual gets demoted, they get put on a reinstatement list, and then the next time we have a vacancy in the captain rank, that person is re-promoted. They've already shown that they um, you know, scored well, excuse me, so scored well on the test and the assessment, that they have earned that position, so they get that position. So that's the very specific um, uh, instance that, that that deals with. However, we do 
demo have other demotions and those demotions is when somebody has shown a propensity that they cannot handle that rank um, that almost always, uh, to my knowledge, it always is accompanied by an administrative investigation um, that usually results in discipline as well as the demotion. So the language in the contract basically that talks about reinstatement is specific to some, when someone's demoted because of a chain of command or a domino impact, not because of anything they did or didn't do deal, dealing with discipline. Correct. Not, right. not through any fault of their own. Right. Okay. That's a good explanation. Thank you. Um, next question, if an officer resigns from duty in an attempt to avoid disciplinary action regarding a serious infraction, are there any circumstances where they would be inappropriate to allow them to be reinstated and keep their original tenure on the police force? Yes. So um, the, uh, a lot of the, the narrative you may have heard nationally and, and even locally, um, one of the, the reform measures that's being called for is a national database of officers who have been terminated um, for excessive force or you know, terminated from a police department for cause. Um, so that person can't then be hired by someone else. Um, Texas has that in place through the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. So anytime an officer separates from a police department, um, they are, that agency is required to fill out a form characterizing that separation as either honorable, general, or dishonorable. So if somebody resigns from a police department to avoid a disciplinary action, that person cannot get an honorable discharge. It is uh, put on that form and that form is accessible to any other agency that's looking to hire that individual. In Fort Worth, we, even if we're reappointing someone um, that, that has left our agency, we conduct a background check on that person. So we will look at the circumstances surrounding the separation in the first place and somebody who had left to avoid a disciplinary case would not be rehired. Okay, thank you. Next question is, if an officer is indicted for a felony or officially charged with a commission of a class A or B misdemeanor, the chief may temporarily suspend that person with or without pay for a period not to exceed 45 calendar days after the date of the final disposition of the indictment or complaint. Why is the chief given this discretion? Okay, so this provision here mirrors uh, the Texas State Civil Service Law. Uh, I think it's 143.056. And it's so that's the same language that allows the chief to suspend this officer um, with or without pay while the criminal case is proceeding. And the reason for that that is in there is because uh, TCOL, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, isn't going to pull an officer's license until there is a conviction. So this provision allows the chief to suspend the officer so that officer doesn't have to continue working for the department while this case is ongoing if the chief believes there's enough there that they don't want to do that. Um, since I took over, those suspensions are always without pay. Um, but the difference between the Texas Local Government Code, the State Civil Service Law, and this article in this agreement is the number of days after final conviction or after final uh, disposition of the case in which the department has to act. So the State Civil Service Law gives the department 30 days after the final disposition to go ahead and complete the administrative investigation and take any disciplinary action. This article gives us an additional 15 days to conduct that. What we didn't want to happen was it, this final disposition of a criminal case happens ar around the holidays or while someone's on vacation in the chain of command and it sits on somebody's desk for a week or two and then we're hard pressed to get it done within the statute um, time frame. So this gives us a 15 day st uh, safety net basically. And so in essence, in this case, is if somebody is found not guilty and they didn't it allows you more time to ensure whatever administrative action you're going to have to be investigated and, and bring that forward. Right. Oftentimes that helps to have a full investigation if there's an appeal by the officer involved so there's less chance for it to be appealed what the actual discipline is done. That's correct. And, and in situations like this, our investigation is complete by the time the criminal case is done, but the chain of command review is not because we're waiting to see what the court ruled on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question or issue, the chief is permitted to hire officers from other agencies. Can you give information on how you make the lateral hires and provide the criteria and, and procedures for the modified hiring process? 
Yeah, so these lateral entry candidates, what we talked about earlier, hiring from other departments, um, both them, the reappointed officers, and uh, new recruit officers um, are all required to pass the identical steps in the hiring process, um, including but not limited to like the medical examination, the drug screen, the physical uh, agility test, uh, psychological exam. Uh, before they can be considered for employment as a police officer. And any candidate who fails uh, is, is removed from the process at that point. Um, in addition, we, we do background checks on all, these, all the applicants as well. So a lateral entry officer that's, that's applying would still be assigned to a background investigator who would then contact the other agency or agencies where that individual worked and see what kind of disciplinary act, uh, history that individual has and um, also reach out to people in the department to find out what kind of officer he was while he was working there. And so basically all the same steps except they, when they come into the academy, for their port, part of the training, they come in as police officers versus cadets? Yes, so they, they will be commissioned police officers, so they don't have to go through some of the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement requirements to become a police officer, but they still have to go through many weeks of training to see how we want things done in Fort Worth, to learn our values and, and our procedures and our training. Um, and then they still, uh, upon completion of the academy, they go out into a field training phase, um, just like the other uh, recruits do, and, and they will also uh, do at least a week with the, one of the neighborhood police officers. So really the big difference is just not having to go through the process of becoming licensed peace officers in, in Texas. Yes, and learning, because all, the, have that. And learning all the basic um, roles and responsibilities of a police officer. Okay. They are learning Fort Worth specific um, issues. Um, that's why their academy is abbreviated compared to the almost nine month new recruit academy okay. and, and their field training is abbreviated also. Thank you. Um, next question is why do officers with military experience now get an additional point toward their corporal exam? Okay, well, I, the, there are many benefits of, of military service and training that prepare an individual to continue serving their community as a police officer. Uh, leadership training, uh, discipline, um, the ability, learning the ability to follow direction, but also to think creatively and independently to solve problems. That's something that the military is very good at. That's why so many leadership books uh, out there are written by military veterans. Um, so that's the value in, in, in adding that point there to show um, our appreciation for their service. Um, but if, you know, when they're in the academy, they're learning that guardianship and servant mindset. If we have an individual who can't get off the warrior mindset um, or that doesn't embrace the training and the values that we're, we're trying to teach, then they'll be recommended for termination. Thank you. Um, next question is, what is the incentive for mental health? What training will, uh, will they receive on how to handle stress? Okay, so we don't really have an incentive for mental health or requirement uh, for mental health screening beyond the uh, entry level psychological examination that we give. But all recruits receive training on stressors and healthy ways to deal with stress. Um, fitness, wellness, and stress management is one of the classes. Alcohol and stress management is another class. Peer support is a, is a third uh, course of instruction. And all of our officers are also um, uh, that those courses are also open to them as well. And then the city has the employee assistance program to help with any mental well-being uh, or counseling concerns an officer has. And we have also partnered um, with uh, the Police Officers Association and a private group that offers uh, mental wellness for first responders specific. Okay. Um, and one final question for the chief before we move on. Um, this isn't directly related to meet and confer agreement, but it's an important question based on some of the recent incidents in the city. What will you do to, um, to rebuild the trust in our communities of color in the city? Okay, so the, the national discussion on police reform going on and, and even locally is, 
has actually produced a lot of really good ideas, um, stuff that we are interested in pursuing uh, with the passage of the Crime Control and Prevention District uh, sales tax uh, gives us the opportunity to do some of these things. Uh, one of the, uh, ever since we had the CCPD, there's been a community-based programs component of that where uh, different uh, nonprofit or, or private entities can apply for CCPD funding to push certain crime prevention or crime reduction measures out there. And we've been funding a lot of these programs, uh, but we've, what we've noticed as we take this critical look at CCPD is uh, the funding for a lot of those programs has remained stagnant, even though the dollars raised by CCPD have gone up exponentially. So we are looking at um, actually offering more of those dollars towards some of these initiatives after they've been properly vetted uh, as, you know, and shown that they can be something that is, is good for the community. Um, one of the other things we're looking at is expanding our crisis intervention teams, our CIT teams as we call them. Those are teams where we have an officer who is certified as a mental health peace officer. So they've gone through additional training and certification. They're paired with a mental health worker and they answer calls dealing with uh, individuals uh, suffering mental crises or uh, chronic substance abuse. Um, we started with a, a group of eight, a sergeant, a corporal, and six officers, and uh, they were very successful. Um, they, they showed a, a significant decrease in the number of calls coming in uh, because they also work proactively to address people they know are, who have had mental crises, and they proactively go out and make sure they uh, have their medications, see if they need any referrals, see if they need anything else. Um, and so that proactivity reduces some of the calls to 911. Um, so we want to increase that unit to where we now can staff two shifts instead of just the one shift um, and address, uh, increase the number of calls that group takes to um, uh, lessen the, the patrol officer's time that they spend dealing with that since the patrol officer doesn't quite have all the same resources um, or training as the, somebody certified at the MHPO level. Um, as we did a review on uses of force, we found that that CIT team used very few uh, incidents of use of force, even though they dealt with a population that you might think would have more uses of force involved in that. So it's right. something we want to look at further and, and see if we can, uh, if that plays out as we expand the unit. Um, we also uh, want to create what we're calling uh, tentatively a community services division. And you may have seen uh, operations like this in cities like Denver, or Fort Collins, Colorado. Locally, North Richland Hills has a division like this. Arlington PD does. And this is a group of non-sworn individuals. So they're not police officers. They're not in a, a uniform like I'm in. They don't have a gun. Um, they're not in a police car, although they'll be in a vehicle. And they are tasked with responding to calls that really don't need a police officer, calls that police officers never used to respond to, but because people would call 911 and want a response and police were always on 24 seven, the police officers got tasked with dealing with some of this stuff. So, um, you know, they can help with accident scenes, they can help with parking violations, um, it, animal calls when animal control is not around. Um, it, just looking at a, at a quick blush, we, we look at there could be up to 50,000 calls a year that this group could take off patrol, allowing those officers that to be, be available. Yeah, yeah, allow those officers to be available for real emergency situations and to go back to being the beat officers that they, they were asked to be. Well, those are, those are great, sound like great ideas that, you know, to take forward. Before I move to our next speaker, uh, there is one question that came in. Are there uh, programs with Fort Worth ISD encouraging students to become officers. Yeah, so um, Fort Worth ISD has one campus, it's Eastern Hills High School, that actually has a criminal justice club. And I've been out there a couple times. Our officers interact with the group um, quite regularly. Um, they've come to the police headquarters. Um, we've given them tours of the, both the academy and the headquarters. Um, and that is the, the one group in Fort Worth ISD that I'm aware of. Um, some of the other ISDs also have uh, law enforcement clubs. I think there may be other clubs within Fort Worth ISD as well. Um, but the criminal justice class in, in Eastern Hills, I believe, is the biggest one. But um, yeah, so there are several. Isn't our cadet class primarily made up of Fort Worth ISD? 
So, students and, and Crowley mostly? Uh, uh, students and graduates of, and graduates. of those ISDs. Um, so uh, we also have the Explorer program and we have explorers uh, go into the schools and recruit for that program as well. And then we bring those students down to our uh, training facility uh, for, the, for the training. They take them on competitions and, and stuff like that. And we've had several of our explorers uh, pr uh, progress into being police officers. That's great. Well, Chief, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. Our next speaker uh, regarding the meet and confer agreement uh, will be Manny Ramirez, the president of the uh, Fort Worth Police Officers Association. He will uh, answer questions uh, from his perspective that we received. Um, thank you, Manny, for joining us. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me. Uh, um, the first question I have for you is uh, one that I asked Chief Krause, but I would like to get your response and from the perspective of the uh, the police association is why do officers with military experience now get an should get an additional point toward their corporal exam? Well, you know the the training value structure uh, and leadership experience that's acquired um, through military service. I mean that provides a direct benefit to the citizens of Fort Worth and to the Fort Worth PD. Um, and the members of the Fort Worth POA uh, will always value and respect um, those who've sacrificed to serve our nation. And so we felt like um, you know civil service already incentivizes it through the entrance exam, um, but we felt like um, those qualifications, those leadership qualifications are important um, when they're promoting through the ranks as well. So uh, that additional point is, is a, uh, basically a, a reward for, for their service uh, to our nation. Thank you. So in the meet and confer agreement, we talk about peer representatives and association representatives. Are there requirements uh, for someone to become a peer representative or a representative of an officer from the association? Absolutely, so peer representatives and association representatives, uh, they take training through a, uh, a legal representative um, and they learn their role in the administrative process. Uh, they adhere to strict guidelines set by internal affairs investigators and they don't participate or interfere with uh, the interview in any form or fashion. Their role is to observe and ensure that an officer's due process rights are protected. Okay. Um, the agreement also states that there's no privilege to protect statements or dis disclosures to our, uh, officers, representatives in any way, in any criminal manner. Why would re a representative not be able to testify about knowledge acquired through the representative's role as the officer's representative in the absence of, a, of privilege? You know, I think that might be a little bit of a misconception. Um, one criterion for selection as a peer representative or an association representative uh, is that the representative has no personal knowledge of the, the case or, or um, you know, the, 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 uh, the violation in question. Uh, the peer representative is instructed uh, not to interview, counsel, uh, otherwise discuss the case with the involved officer. Um, and the peer representative should never have knowledge uh, outside of what is observed through their role as a peer representative um, observer in the internal affairs interview. Um, and if they do learn or discover any, any information outside of that uh, role, um, they are subject to being called to testify about that knowledge. So we're very specific when we instruct our, our peer representatives uh, how to conduct themselves um, in the process. And, and, and they know that they're strictly uh, advocates for due process and that they, they should not be uh, interfering with the investigation. If they do, they themselves can become subjects of the investigation. So in essence, they're just there to ensure that the steps required under the agreement are followed uh, in due process for that, that individual that's being investigated. Absolutely, that's it. Um, so tell us how do, do across the board increases impact job performance? What, wouldn't increases be more effective if they were incentivized based on one's merit? You know, I think merit pay would be great. Um, I, think, I think, you know, efficient companies uh, that can offer bonuses and rewards for, for good pay is, uh, is a great thing. However, in, in a public service career, you know, EMS, fire, police services, um, there really is no objective, absolute uh, objective way to measure that performance uh, in the public safety career. Um, objective standards are the best practice to protect against a good old boy system, um, and, and that makes compensation relying on subjective criteria. So the entire civil service framework uh, and contract framework exists to set objective standards um, so that everything is on a level playing field. And yeah, merit pay would be great, um, but there is no uh, way we can, you know, basically incentivize production or quotas or anything like that. Those are all things we hope to avoid. All right. 
So tell us how the Fort Worth POA work with the black and Latino POAs when it comes to the agreement and other issues that face the department and the, and the officers themselves. Yeah, so the, the black POA and the Latino POA, actually it's the BLLEOA and the NLEOA, um, they're fraternal organizations, they're not labor organizations. Um, the presidents of each of these organizations is appointed uh, as a member of my 18-member um, board of directors, uh, and they have direct involvement in the labor management process and in, the, uh, in setting the contract priorities before we go to bargain this contract. Um, now, these organizations are tremendous in that uh, they provide value to the community. They provide services in the community um, from their membership perspective. Uh, and I'm actually a member of, of all three organizations. Uh, and the bulk majority of BPOA and LPO members are POA members. Um, we found that as a labor group, um, we're very unique in that we're not separate. We're all together. And so uh, we appoint those presidents uh, to our board of directors so that their viewpoints may be heard um, every single week I'm speaking to those presidents to ask them if there's any unique challenges facing their membership and if there's anything they would like to see uh, from the Fort Worth POA as far as advocacy is concerned. Um, and so we work very closely together and so as, they, as it pertains to the contract, uh, they have direct input whenever we're setting our priorities. All right, thank you. Next question is why is the POA so involved in the hiring process of the Fort Worth Police Department? You know, as I mentioned, the, the civil service system is an objective standard system. And uh, maintaining fair, equitable, and objective hiring standards are fundamental uh, to establishing a professional police department. Now, in order to ensure that the city of Fort Worth can recruit and retain uh, the highest caliber of trainee, uh, we have to ensure that those standards are never compromised. Um, we've seen uh, examples around the country um, where, for political reasons, sometimes hiring standards were lowered uh, to increase the number of recruits. Uh, the results are, you know, subjective and unfair hiring practices and, um, you know, minimum, minimum standards exist uh, to make the hiring process fair and equitable. Um, and, you know, our, our brothers and sisters with, with the fire department, um, they're equally involved in the, in the hiring process. Um, and like I said, it really is for, to set those objective standards to make sure we can recruit and retain uh, the top applicants out there because, uh, as, as the chief covered earlier, um, we're in a very tough uh, environment for recruiting and retaining and I think that the minimum standards there we can't we can't cut those just because you know it's tough. Well thanks for coming tonight to help and pro provide the POA's perspective on some of this uh, on the meet and confer agreement. Um, the the final guest tonight um, and hopefully we've been able to shed some light and, and provide uh, information from your perspective uh, is our senior assistant city attorney uh, that was involved in, in the negotiations and he specializes in employment and pension and human resources uh, side of the law for the city. Uh, Chris Trout, thank you for joining us, Chris. Sure. Uh, I'll be asking you to provide us some information from uh, legal questions that we received from the public and our residents. Um, the first question has to do with Article 7, Section 2 and the 48-hour waiting period. Can you explain why this waiting period is in the agreement, why it exists? And I think oftentimes people can fuse that uh, with how quick we, the, the police force or the police department can react to criminal complaint regarding a police officer. Okay. So if you could touch on that. Sure thing. Well, first of all, you know, we've given everyone a lot of information about uh, what's in Chapter 143. And what we're talking about is the, the Texas Local Government Code. And since 1947, police officers and firefighters in Fort Worth have been under civil service which means that the terms and conditions of their employment are largely set out in Chapter 143 of the Local Government Code. And any time a city is under civil service, uh, if, if the city or the uh, officers or, or firefighters want to change anything uh, that's in Chapter 143, the only way to do that is through a meet and confer agreement. And that's what this meet and confer agreement is all about. That is, there are things in Chapter 143 that we felt don't work for us, that we want to change, and um, other, other information that we want to, um, uh, we want to provide. So the 48-hour 48, 48 requirement uh, only applies in administrative investigations. And what we're talking about there is uh, an investigation that might lead to a disciplinary action in the officer's employment. Not a, criminal, not a criminal matter. 
and um, a concern has been raised about whether an officer might use that 48 hours to try to change the facts or change the evidence or influence witnesses. Well, if an officer is found to have done that, to change facts or evidence or improperly influence an investigation, they would certainly face disciplinary consequences because of that. That might be even more severe than the conduct they are being investigated for uh, originally. Now, let me mention one other thing. Typically, in an investigation involving an allegation of officer misconduct, the involved officer is the last person that the investigator uh, talks to. And the reason for that is the investigator likes to gather the information that's relevant to the matter and then have that all available to confront the officer and, and talk about the allegations of misconduct when the investigator knows all the facts already. So basically, the 48 hours, lots of times, is it's going to take that long to get to the actual in oh, yeah. questioning of the officer anyway, and right. so the officer it doesn't have a big impact. The officer may not be questioned for several weeks right. after the incident, so that 48 hours typically doesn't um, pose any kind of problem for the investigators. Okay, thank you. Now, that same article allows officers to review videos uh, or other material, but only the officer's association or peer, peer representative or attorney is allowed to in the room while the officer's doing that. Can you provide a, a situation or illustrate a situation that requires this clause? Sure. Um, you can imagine a situation where uh, an officer is being investigated for something that's been captured on their body camera. Um, well, the officer gets an opportunity to review what the body camera shows before they're questioned about it. And they can have that um, review um, in the presence of their peer or association representative and their legal counsel if they want. Uh, but as I think you touched on earlier, uh, no one is allowed to make a copy of the video. They're not allowed to discuss what's in, in the video outside of that room and only the peer representative, the officer, and uh, the officer's legal counsel is allowed to be in the room during that time. And so in essence, the ability for them to review is because nobody's memory is 100%. Yes. And uh, one of the things we want to make sure is that the officer doesn't necessarily provide some kind of information that wasn't, isn't tied to the video itself and, and creates another issue that may not be there. Sure, uh, an anyway. investigation is designed to, to um, find the truth. Right. And the best way to do that in this situation is for the officer to have an opportunity to look at something like a body camera video before have, having to answer questions about what happened. Thank you. Now, uh, can you explain to us why it's beneficial and necessary to provide back pay to an officer who is on leave due to a commission of a felony or class B or A misdemeanor? Sure. Well, one thing you have to remember is that as a public employee with civil service protection, an officer's job and pay cannot be taken from them without due process of law. Those protections are in the United States Constitution and also in state law, Chapter 143 that we've been talking about. Um, in the situation um, that you're, you're, you're speaking of, where an officer is temporarily suspended without pay and then is acquitted of the charge brought against them, well, after that acquittal, the officer can request that the Civil Service Commission uh, require the city to pay him back pay. And in that situation, the commission can then decide to agree or reject the officer's request. So the officer may or may not get back pay. And if the officer is not acquitted, then they don't recover back pay if they've been temporarily, temporarily suspended without pay while the criminal case is pending. And typically, if they are not, if they are acquitted, I mean, if they're not acquitted and they're found guilty, they typically are no longer with the, the police department anyway. So. That's true. So tell us um, how hearing examiners are chosen when it comes to appeals. Sure. Um, the list of hearing examiners um, are, are, are the list of people are, are typically lawyers uh, in this area, and they, um, under the meet and confer agreement, uh, they are required to have some experience handling police civil service disciplinary appeals. Now, there are not a lot of people in Texas, not a lot of lawyers in Texas, who have that kind of experience. So the pool that we are drawing from is is kind of small. Uh, and the reason for that requirement is that many of the rules and procedures that apply in civil service appeals are unique to civil service. An arbitrator who doesn't have um, that prior experience would have to be educated by the parties about the process, and that would unnecessarily prolong the, the proceedings. 
Now, um, the meet and confer agreement requires the city and the police officers association to agree on a list of eight people with three alternates to serve, serve as hearing examiners or arbitrators to hear the disciplinary appeals and grievances that are brought because of alleged violation of the meet and confer agreement. Now the people on the current list of hearing examiners are mostly from the Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and Houston areas. And they all have the required experience and backgrounds needed. And uh, I, I will say that, um, uh, two, two more points on that. When it comes time to actually choose someone to uh, hear a disciplinary appeal, uh, the meet and confer agreement requires that the parties either agree on someone on that list or if they can't reach an agreement, then the first person at the top of the list, it's a rotating list, the first person on the list is chosen by default. And the arbitrator's decision is final. If anyone wants to look at the list of arbitrators, uh, that list is public and it is displayed at City Hall, I think on the north entrance. So um, while we're on the hearing examiners, the one year term, it, term limit uh, in the agreement was removed. Um, why was this done? Well, we found that there really was no need for it because any hearing examiner can be removed from the list by agreement of the parties. So if we found that a hearing examiner was not doing their job well, they could be removed from the list without having to wait for the year uh, to end to remove them. So in essence, we're taking out a clause from the agreement that really didn't serve a purpose. Yeah, that's right. Um, but one of the questions that we got in tonight is why does an officer that commits a crime get to review evidence? That's the, the question. I think there's a presumption uh, that an officer that commit, that's being investigated for a crime, not for administrative, mm -hmm. they get to review evidence uh, of the investigation related to that crime. And I think there's, uh, and you can correct me, but I believe there's a, a, a misinterpretation. The, the review of the body cam video or anything like that has to do with an administrative that's investigation. Right not a criminal investigation. So that, that's right. in that, essence, the, the officer does not have the ability to, to review evidence on a criminal case against them. Yeah, that's my understanding. And, and criminal investigations are typically done by the Special Investigations Unit, or SIU, whereas administrative investigations, that is an investigation that might affect the officer's employment, whether they might be fired or um, given a suspension without pay, uh, those investigations are done by inter internal affairs and they're what we call administrative investigations. Um, back to the, we just got a question in and I don't know if you know the exact answer, but how diverse are the hearing examiners? I'm thinking they're, th they're talking diversity in sex, you know, female, male, and or ethnicity. My, my memory of that is that uh, most of them are male, uh, most of them are over 50. A lot of those that are uh, older are no longer taking cases, so I think our new list is going to look a lot different than our current list. Um, we try very hard to find um, people with the experience that are re that's required who are uh, members of the minority community or persons of color or, or female, and we have, at, I think, two of the eight are, are female. All right, thank you. But we'll, we'll work hard to get that list uh, a little bit more representative of the community. So when it comes to scheduling a hearing, what's the time frame uh, for the hearing to, to follow for to the conclusion of the criminal investigation or criminal prosecution? So after, um, after a criminal investigation or criminal case is completed, typically the department will make a decision about whether to impose discipline within 30 or 45 days after the final disposition of that case. Then, if the officer appeals that discipline, then the 180-day period that we provided in Article 7 uh, would be followed. That is, we try to have that hearing accomplished and finished within 180 days. And keep in mind that the department can impose discipline on an officer regardless of whether the officer was convicted or acquitted. Uh, and a felony conviction, I think as Chief Krauss mentioned earlier, uh, is the equivalent of a termination. Is there a clause that disallows the chief from negotiating with other labor organizations? Does, can the chief, for instance, negotiate with the, the Black Police Officers Association or the Latino Police Officers Association? Well, the chief is prohibited from um, 
bargaining with anyone other than the Fort Worth Police Officers Association. And that's because that is the organization that the Fort Worth Police Officers have chosen to represent them. Uh, there was an election by the Fort Worth Police Officers, I think back in 2006 maybe, maybe early, earlier than that, um, that they wanted the Police Officers Association to represent them. And at that point, the city could only negotiate with the Police Officers Association regarding terms and conditions of employment for Fort Worth police officers. Now, that doesn't prevent the chief from meeting with organizations like the Black Law Enforcement Officers or the National Latino um, uh, Law Enforcement Organization to hear their concerns, discuss anything, but he cannot negotiate with anyone other than the Fort Worth uh, Police Officers Association. And it's my understanding that Chief Krause does meet with those organizations regularly. And, and that requirement or inability to do that is set out in state law when a meet and confer situation is set up by through the vote of the citizens. That's right. Yeah, the Fort Worth Police Officers Association is the sole and exclusive bargaining agent for police officers by law. So um, are Fort Worth PD employees allowed to file grievances that pertain to discrimination? Um, yes, any police officer who believes they've experienced discrimination based on any protected class, such as race, color, age, sex, disability, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, they can file an internal complaint with human resources, or they can go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and potentially file a lawsuit against the city. The purpose of the provision in the meet and confer agreement that says that discrimination complaints cannot be heard as a grievance is so that um, any complaint a person, an officer has about discrimination is decided in the proper form, the form the law requires, um, such as the EEOC and a court of law, rather than a, as a grievance that an arbitrator gets to decide rather than a court or jury. Thank you. So one of the questions that came in is can negotiations be reopened? And I'll start off by answering that with the negotiations, negotiations can be reopened. Uh, at this point, the city manager is recommending uh, this agreement. It's been ratified by the Police Officer Association. Um, and the city manager is recommending that this agreement be put forward and is going to be put forward to city council on August 4th. It could be reopened if the city council chooses to provide staff direction that they would like the agreement to be uh, reopened for ne additional negotiations uh, and it would really help in that case from city staff and what portions of the agreement uh, they would like for us to to really uh, look into and, and try to renegotiate so uh, at this point the city manager is recommending that this agreement go forward and, and that it be adopted uh, so the city council could re could deny approving this agreement, which would then require uh, any, uh, any uh, negotiations to occur that they deem uh, we, we need to follow. So uh, that's really the process. There's not, nothing magic about it. Uh, the current agreement continues through September 30th, and then as we said earlier, there's an evergreen period for another year if negotiations would, would continue. And, and you touched on it earlier. The agreement doesn't exist until two things happen. The uh, POA membership, ratifies it, and then the city council approves it. If either of those two things don't happen, then there is no agreement. That's correct. So the city council could choose not to vote on it, not do anything, and it would not, the current agreement would just continue in place. That's right. The next question we have is, what's the difference between a chain of custody investigation and administration, administrative investigation? All right, and, and we're talking again about uh, investigations involving an, empl an employment issue. Uh, an administrative investigation is one that's conducted by an internal affairs investigator. And that's a detective who is specifically trained in conducting investigations uh, of officers for allegations of misconduct. A chain of command investigation is one conducted by someone in an officer's supervisory chain of command. In other words, the officer's boss or his boss's boss. Now, internal affairs typically handles more serious, complicated investigations. And the chain of command typically investigates less serious, less complicated allegations of misconduct. Now remember, investigators find facts. They don't make judgment calls as to whether misconduct actually occurred 
and they don't make, re make recommendations for dis disciplinary action. Either type of investigation uh, through internal affairs or chain of command um, can result in any level of discipline from a temporary suspension of one to 15 days without pay to an indefinite suspension or termination of employment. Um, the proposed meet and confer agreement um, as you, I think you pointed out earlier, allows both officers and investigators to record interviews, whether it's a chain of command investigation or one by eternal affairs. So Chris, tell us when Major Casey unit turns over the product of its investigation to internal affairs, this will not include any interview by the involved officer. Please provide an explanation as to why the interview would not be included. Okay. Now this goes back to the difference between criminal investigations and administrative ones. Um, and we talked about SIU a little while ago. Now SIU, Special Investigations Unit, investigates allegations of criminal misconduct by officers. Now Major Case Unit investigates more high profile incidents including critical police incidents and officer involved shootings. And those matters can lead to criminal charges against an involved officer. So when an officer gives an interview with major case, that's a voluntary statement. It's a voluntary interview given by the, uh, by the officer. And just like any member of the public, an officer has a Fifth Amendment right to not give a statement that could be used, used later to incriminate him. The officer cannot be threatened with losing their job for not giving a, a statement to major case. However, an officer can be compelled under threat of losing their job to give an interview or statement to internal affairs or a chain of command investigation because that's not a criminal investigation. But anything that the officer says in that compelled interview or statement cannot be used in the criminal case against the officer. And that's known as what's called a, a Garrity right. And it's required by law. Now there's a concern that officers uh, will refuse to cooperate in major case investigations, which is their right, if their statement or, or interview could be used to impose discipline and that could then make major case investigations less effective. Now an officer who gives voluntarily uh, an interview or statement to major case is entitled to request a copy of that interview or statement and that's how the officer might have a copy of the internal of, of the um, of the statement when internal affairs would not. The solution to that is internal affairs just interviews the officer again. Okay, thank you for that. Now, if additional violations are found during an investigation, are they required to be reported? The Texas Local Government Code, the chapter 143 we've been talking about, has specific requirements about how a complaint of misconduct against an officer has to be documented and by whom. Usually, the complaint must be signed by the person who's harmed by the alleged misconduct. And the purpose of the provision in the meet and confer agreement that we're talking about here is to clarify another way that a complaint of misconduct can be presented to the officer and further allows the investigator who learned of the alleged misconduct to be the one who investigates the allegations. Usually that's not the case. Usually the person who reports allegations doesn't get to investigate them. But you have to understand that an investigator who's conducting investigation has to have discretion to choose what allegations merit additional investigation and which, for a variety of reasons, do not present a credible or significant allegation of misconduct. And if we had a requirement that every single allegation of any type of misconduct, no matter how small, had to be investigated, that would unnecessarily prolong investigations and make it harder to defend the resulting disciplinary action, defend, defend the disciplinary action if there's an appeal. And secondly, it would distract the investigator from investigating the, the serious allegations of misconduct that he, he or she was asked to investigate to begin with. All right, thank you. Now can you, uh, th one of the questions came in is, has to do with the working day. Can you explain the definition of working day and what happens if an officer is assigned to a work shift that is longer? Many police officers work four 10-hour shifts per week. Others work five eight-hour shifts per week. And the provision that you're talking about in the meet and confer agreement deals mostly with holiday pay, and it's intended to allow officers who work a 10-hour shift to have a full day off on a holiday because 
the city only gives employees eight hours for a holiday. For instance, when I don't work on a holiday, I work five eight hour shifts, so I get eight hours of leave on that day. Well, that covers my time. A police officer who has a 10 hour schedule, well, that eight hours doesn't cover his entire scheduled um, shift. So um, we could have them come in and work two hours on Christmas Day, or we could uh, have them required, require them to use their own leave for that two hours. That didn't seem fair. So it seemed fair to allow the officer to use 10 hours of leave, or get credit for 10 hours uh, on a holiday rather than just eight hours. And, so, and let me mention this. Uh, it, a question has come up about somebody who might be under uh, temporary suspension. Uh, if that happens, can they work those extra two hours? No, they can't. If someone's on a temporary suspension, they've been suspended without pay, they're considered to be on an eight-hour shift at that time. So their eight hours is, covers their time, and they're not allowed to work the additional time while they're on suspension. So in essence, it's a very technical and minute situation or a specific situation having to do with labor, the labor contract and how a police officer who, like you mentioned, works 10 hours a day under the regular city process would only get eight hours of holiday even though they would be shortened two hours of their pay that week. So these are the type of, uh, of issues that this meet and confer agreement cover. And it really intended to provide clarity so that there's not, uh, uh, and provide guides to both management and to the officers themselves so that we have uh, steps and processes to clear those things up so they don't come up all the time and they're, and they're done in a uniform way. I just wanted to point that out that really the meet and confer agreement is a labor agreement uh, specifically between the city and the police officers association and the police officers themselves. So with that, um, Chris, thank you for your time. Um, the, we do have a couple of, of, uh, of questions that are coming in from uh, the internet or phone calls. Uh, you might want to come back here. Chris, one of the questions is, why are work days defined when discussing disciplinary action? Or the chief might be a better. Well, um, work, work days are defined so that when someone is suspended for three days without pay, we, we know what that means. For, for a person who works an eight-hour shift or maybe a 10-hour shift. Um, it, it, when you say a day, you have, to, you have to decide how long that is. Um, and that's why, that's why a definition has to be in that agreement. So it clarifies that it's work days, days that they would actually be paid, not just calendar days. You're going to be off for three days, and maybe they were only scheduled to work one day of those three days. Right, a person who's suspended for uh, a one calendar day that happens to be their day off Right. isn't really suspended. So it's just really clearing up that language so that folks understand it. That's right. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, um, we've run out of time here uh, this evening, and uh, that's all the time we have for questions. So we'll be putting this recording on YouTube and in our video library at, at fortworthtexas.gov. Thank you for watching, and we will strive to provide uh, answers to all the questions that we did not get to, if we, if we have any, uh, that came in tonight. Thank you again uh, for your time and for watching.